welcome to the latest Down the Rabbit Hole interview. Today, I'm joined by Benjamin Verno, who's going to tell us all about the fascinating field of ancient environmental genomics. So without further ado, Benjamin, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and perhaps give us an overview of some of your work? Yeah, so thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm a scientist here at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. Um, and I have a group and we study ancient environmental genomics. But I guess I got my start in this field studying Neanderthal DNA and studying the interactions between humans and Neanderthals. Um, so I have a, a long history in ancient DNA, but these days we're looking at DNA in sediments. Brilliant, that's great. Thank you for that overview. Um, so I guess let's start with the basics. So what is ancient environmental genomics? Yeah, so the idea is that we essentially leave DNA around everywhere we go, right? Us and, and other animals. And typically for ancient DNA practices, what we do is we find a bone or a tooth and we drill into it and we get the DNA out in that way. And that way we can study a person or an animal. Um, but, you know, we don't have to do that, right? If we can get the DNA from the environment, then that can be beneficial for a lot of reasons. Um, but also uh, in a lot of circumstances, we just don't have those bones around, right? And so in this way, essentially we're developing ways to get our DNA from the places where we live, right? The places where we used to be. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so you kind of sort of touched on there certain situations um, where this might be useful. So could you elaborate on that? Like why can environmental genomics help in certain research situations? Yeah, so a lot of my research is on Neanderthals, is on really old human populations. And, you know, back then, it's not clear that people buried their dead. Uh, if they did bury their dead, we certainly haven't been able to find the places where they did that. And so for a lot of time periods, we just don't have any bones, right? And so if you don't have any bones or teeth from people, you can still see that their tools are there. You can see that they lived there even for tens of thousands of years. But without their bones, we just can't study them genetically, right? We can't tell what population they were, who they're related to, how they got there, et cetera. Um, and so if we can get their DNA from the dirt instead, then that can fill in some of those gaps, right? So that's that's one big way in which we use it so far. Yeah. And so um, obviously there's that situation if you don't have bones or teeth, um, but is there other information you can get from environmental DNA that you might not be able to get from like bones or teeth anyway? Yeah. So, I mean, there are some things that you can figure out, right? So in in some sense, an environmental sample often has DNA from multiple individuals, right? So you get maybe a broader look at, at things. Now, the amount of DNA that we can get out of a sediment sample is really small. So we would always prefer to have a bone if we could, you know, but, um, but one thing we can't get from bones. So for example, in some of our work, we'll do these time series where we, you know, we know that people, Neanderthals or someone has occupied a site for 50,000 years. And we can take sediment samples going all the way through that 50,000 years, you know, representing every couple of thousand years. And there's no way we could do that with bones, right? That we just wouldn't find the human remains sort of spaced out in that in that time series. So that's, um, that, I think there are a lot of things we can do with sediments. That's one, one pretty obvious one. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, and so just going back to sort of your own interest in this area, um, how and why did you first get inspired or interested in environmental DNA? Or ancient well, I've been studying, yeah, sure. So I've been studying ancient DNA and ancient populations for a long time. And it essentially became really clear that we were just missing out on a lot of human history. You know, there, were, there was a whole lot of human history where we didn't have the bones and that we weren't able to answer the questions we wanted to answer. You know, how did Neanderthals get to this particular place? When did humans meet them? This sort of stuff. And so the hope was that by getting into the sediment DNA, by, by getting the DNA there, we could fill in these gaps. So the original motivation really was um, to try to fill in the gaps in the sort of genetic archeological record. Yeah. Um, and then what inspired you to, to look at sediments specifically as a source of ancient DNA? Well, there's sediments everywhere, essentially, right? That 
in these cave floors, you know, the dirt builds up over time um, or in even not, not inside of caves, right? We have these stratigraphies pretty much everywhere. Every archaeological site has sediments, essentially. And so if you can learn about people who lived at a place by looking at the sediments, then, um, then you just have a very abundant resource. Right. Yeah, um, that's really interesting. So um, you mentioned there as well, like some of the um, small sample sizes um, that are available. Is there any like sort of technology that um, is sort of coming out or that you'd be really interested to see that could perhaps help you get more um, sample out of like the dirt, essentially? Yeah, there's a whole, there's bunch, a whole of bunch of technical stuff that we still need to work on, right, that we still need to make better. So one of the things that we do that really enables us to get the, the DNA out of the sediments is we capture it, is what we call it. So we sort of fish out the DNA molecules that look like human molecules that are the ones that we want, and we leave the rest of it behind. And so this enables us to get human DNA from a sediment sample where it's maybe one in a million or one in 10 million, you know, of the molecules in the sediment sample. Um, but there are all sorts of ways that we could make that better. So a lot of times the sediment samples are have these chemicals in them that inhibit the processes that we use to copy the DNA. And we're trying to figure out ways to get around that inhibition, right? Um, we would like to target more DNA, right? As I said before, we only get a very tiny amount of human DNA out of each sediment sample, and we think we can get better at that. Um, essentially, the technology is always improving. Yeah, um, and I bet you've got quite a few things on your wish list <laughs> in terms of those yeah. technologies. Um, so I get like that's sort of one challenge um, of studying ancient DNA. Are there other challenges involved in this type of research? Yeah, I, the the contextualization of the data is a really big challenge, right? That things move around in these caves, they move around in the system, right? And so the sediment moves, um, we even know that bones and teeth can move through the stratigraphy. And so this has always been a challenge for ancient DNA. I think that while this is a big challenge for sediment DNA, it's actually a place where we can help because we can just take a lot more samples, right? And the, the, the chance that, you know, in five different places in the cave, the exact same accidental movement has happened is really low, right? As opposed to if you find one tooth, maybe a mouse picked it up and carried it through the cave or something like that. Um, and so this is a place that, where we can really help. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, um, I hadn't thought about that aspect of it. Um, so we're sort of getting into the details here. But, um, I wanted to ask you a bit more about um, your paper, the one on ne Neanderthal DNA in cave dirt. Um, could you kind of give us like the top line um, summary of that research paper? Yeah, so this is a prime example of one of these places where we knew that Neanderthals had been there for in this case, 50,000 years, we knew that Neanderthals had lived in this cave, right? So this is longer than modern humans have been in Europe, right? And these Neanderthals lived in this cave. They made tools in the cave. They, they left fragments of the tools around, right? But we didn't have any bones that we could get ancient DNA from. And so we had no way to really study them. And also at this time period in Spain, there also weren't any other Neanderthal bones from the area, right, that, that we could study. And so we, along with our collaborators, the archaeologists, who have excavated that site for decades now, went and took sediment samples really in a very detailed sort of centimeter by centimeter going down through the stratigraphy. So you can sort of see the layers um, on the side of the cave uh, where they've excavated. And we took these sediment samples. And one of the neat things that we found, really the primary thing that we found is A, that we could get Neanderthal DNA for the whole time period, right? So really every couple of thousand years. Um, and B, that there were two groups of Neanderthals that lived there, that, you know, at one point, one of that group, one of those groups died out or moved away or were pushed out or something, and a new group of Neanderthals moved in. Um, and actually, the new group of Neanderthals that moved in seemed to be essentially the, the ancestors of all the Neanderthals that spread out across Europe and populated the rest of Europe and, and western parts of Asia. Um, and so we think this was a pretty significant event, right? And it happened around the time of some climate change events as well, so we don't know if it's tied to that. Um, that is a, an area of future research. But this, this, these are the primary results that we got there. That's really fascinating. Um, it's so interesting that you can sort of see the layers um, and like see take samples like across a broader time period. Um, yeah, that's really fascinating. So obviously, yeah, you said like a new group came in and 
potentially like you know whatever happened they became the the, the group that stayed around and evolved into like the Neanderthals of Europe um so how you mentioned like new research is going to focus on looking at perhaps how that happened like you might not be able to say too much here but like what kind of research or how would you investigate that um further well I think one of the things that is sort of suggested by that result is that there was some place in Europe that Neanderthals were hanging out, you know, were able to survive. So we would call that a refugia, right? Where they were able okay. to survive through the glaciation that came down and covered a lot of Europe with ice. Um, and we don't know where that is, right? So that's a place that we want to find. We don't know if there's just one place or two places. It sort of looks like there's just one place because really all the rest of the Neanderthals that we find in Europe were descended from this group. Um, now, it could also be that we'll find some other Neanderthals that were not descended from the group. You know, there's so much that we don't know about it. Um, but for me, that's the thing I would really like to figure out is where did they survive? Where was their sort of um, oasis during the time of, of the glaciers? Oh, wow. Um, but that involves um, going out in the field quite a lot, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. The idea is to then just look at a lot of lot of caves, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's really fascinating. What kind of things would you be looking for? Like, what kind of, this might be a really basic question, but what kind of signs would you be looking for? What would get you excited um, and make you think, oh, well, this might be the cave? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think it's unlikely that we would find the cave, right? But we might find the region. Um, um, and I'm yeah. sure that there are things that the archaeologists would know to look for, right? That they would know to look for a particular type of tool that is found in a in a time period that we wouldn't expect them to be there or, or something like that. That's not my expertise. And we lean quite a bit on, on the archaeologists, right? Because without that interpretation, right? Without the context, it's just really a pile of dirt uh, that, that we're analyzing, right? Uh, it's, it's not really, uh, doesn't have all that significance without the, the archaeologists. Um, but yeah. in terms of our research, what we would be looking for is, you know, DNA that is the oldest that we can find that still looks like it's the common ancestor of all of the Neanderthals in Europe um, after, yeah. the, after the glaciers. Well, that, that's, um, yeah, that's really intriguing. Um, yeah, you, just a quick one, I think, um, but you mentioned there, like you obviously, you go out in the field and you're sort of working with lots of different scientists or researchers from different areas. So you might have archeologists, um, who who else do you work with? Like who's in that team when you go out to a cave and you sort of sample the dirt or whatever? Yeah, so one of the so most important the people most... is the geoarchaeologist, right? So someone who know who can look at the sediments and look at the stratigraphy and really tell us what's going on. So I mentioned that one of the things that we worry about is the movement of DNA through the stratigraphy. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the tools that we have and that our collaborators have is we can make what's called a micromorphology block that we essentially take a block of sediment, put resin in it, impregnate it with resin so it's hard as, hard as a rock and it's essentially made out of plastic, right? And then you can really look at the sediments and say, okay, we see evidence of little tiny particles moving through the stratigraphy here or everything looks pretty stable. You know, we can even drill into those and take micro samples and say, okay, the DNA in the sediment changes from here to here. Um, so the collaboration with those people has been really crucial. Um, in interpreting the results wow um yeah that's that's kind of amazing the high resolution that you can get um by doing that um so what uh, i think this is something that you mentioned in the paper but um what are some of the problems around using mitochondrial dna versus um the benefits of using nuclear dna instead yeah so our field has a long history of kind of starting with mitochondrial DNA, right? The first Neanderthal sequences were mitochondrial sequences. And one of the reasons for that is that every single cell in your body has tens or hundreds of copies of the mitochondrial genome, but only two copies of the nuclear genome. And so, you know, it's just easier to get that DNA. It's also a much smaller target size, you know, and so it's the first thing that people often study. But, um, it's not super informative for population histories, right? If we want to say that this group was replaced by this other group, or this group came from here and was related to this other group, uh, you can't say that with mitochondrial DNA, because it only carries the DNA from your maternal ancestors, right? Your mother and your grandmother and her grandmother and her grandmother. And that leaves out a lot of the story. Whereas the nuclear genome, you inherit from 
essentially all of your ancestors, right? If you imagine that every generation, you double the number of people going backwards um, that you're related to in the nuclear genome. And so it's, it's really the full picture of your genetic ancestry. What were some of the key takeaways from that paper from your perspective? I mean, in addition to what we were able to tell about the specific Neanderthals who lived at that site, um, I think for me, it was mostly like a proof of concept. Like this is the first time that we were able to get nuclear DNA from sediments. It's the first time that we were able to do sort of proper population genetics, which is what we call our field, right? Where we look at the genetics of large groups of people um, and do that from sediments. And so this really opens up the field. You know, as I said before, every archeological site has sediments. This really is a technique that we can apply pretty much anywhere. Yeah, um, that's really fascinating. And that moves on to, I guess, the next question would be, um, what are you working on at the moment? Well, so I can't talk about specific sites or projects, <laughs> right? Um, but I think, so the thing that we've done so far with the sediment DNA is we've used it in situations where we didn't have bones, right? So we've used it as a replacement for bones. I think that there are a couple of really key things we can do going forward. So for one thing, there are some ancient bones that we shouldn't sample, right? That we shouldn't drill into because it wouldn't be ethically correct to do that. You know, they're cultural right. artifacts for the communities where those bones were found, or they're the only bone of their type, right? And and to, to hurt it, even, you know, we take just actually a tiny, tiny amount of, of bone powder, but still maybe we shouldn't do that in some circumstances. And there are some cases where maybe you could use sediment DNA instead, right? To to circumvent that and to still be able to study these people in a more ethical way. Um, but what I'm really excited about is, you know, when we get DNA from a bone, we essentially get it from where someone died, right? We have a record of their death. We have the record of their final resting place, but they have a, this whole life that we sort of don't know about, right? I'm leaving DNA in my office. You're leaving DNA in your office. And by getting DNA from the sediments, we can study where people lived, right? So we can study, for example, um, if there's a workplace, like who worked in that workplace versus who lived in the in the village nearby, stuff like that. And so I think that by using the sediment DNA, this is the stuff that's really exciting to me now is to be able to study where people actually lived and study their lives as opposed to um, just their deaths. Yeah, that's, I mean, that is fascinating. And when you think about, you know, I hadn't, having not come from this background or this area, um, you don't really think that you are only really studying where those people have died um, rather than where they've spent their entire lives. Um, that's really fascinating. Um, so yeah, this is like, I guess that's specific to your current work, but are there any um, emerging areas in the field, uh, the broader field um, that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of things that people are doing with sediment DNA these days. I mean, we tend to focus on human DNA in the sediments, but there are a bunch of researchers who are doing this for broader environmental questions, um, you know, looking at how the ecosystem changes over time and using the sediment DNA as a fine scale record of that. Again, taking advantage of the fact that we can do many, many samples down through a stratigraphy. Um, I think that there are probably a lot of applications in the field of forensics as well, right? Um, and some of my colleagues have done some of that um, where they look and say, okay, the methods that we have developed for looking at ancient DNA can help more with um, say cold cases or, or something like that. Um, and so this is, yeah, I think that in general, the technology that we develop is useful in, in a lot of different areas. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's, yeah, really interesting. And so um, in terms of like your next steps, um, what sort of, are there any developments um, that you'd like to see in the future that might help with your research or overcome some of the many challenges that we've already discussed um, today? I mean, I guess I would just get greedy, you know? So <laughs> we we typically, from a cave, we might look at between a hundred and a few hundred sediment samples. Um, you know, I would really like to go bigger than that. But in order to do that, we need to um, we need to make it cheaper. We need to develop the technology so we can process more samples. And um, we're also working on ways to target sort of even rarer uh, species that might be in there, right? In some sediment samples, you can't find the human DNA, but you know people were there, right? So to be able to target them more accurately. Um, I mean, the wish list is long, I guess, but in general, 
I would just like more data. Yeah, of course. I, I'm sure that would be most people's sort of wish list. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, that's really great. So that's actually all we've got time for today. Um, I've certainly learned a lot about ancient environmental DNA that I did not know before. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you again for taking the time to answer these questions with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was really great.